So if this is your first time to chat with Green Aggies, welcome. We have this webinar every single week on Thursdays at 12.12 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, we talk about uh, different subjects as it relate to the green industry professionals. So whether you're a grower or professional landscaper or uh, managed turf, we have a multidisciplinary team from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension that uh, kind of manages this webinar. We often will invite some speakers that have specialized in some of these other topics, such as today's guest speaker, who is Miss Suzanne Wainwright, who uh, is, is um, the the, the sole runner and uh, and then operator of Bug Lady Consulting, and she'll be talking about dipping your toes in biological control. And we did originally have uh, a second speaker that uh, something may have uh, unfortunately come up that they might not be able to give that talk today. But we'll look at either rescheduling or getting it recorded and making it available to you. Uh, we also have the rest of our, uh, some of our Chat with Green Aggies team here. So we got uh, Paul Winsky, uh, Mung, Dr. Mung Mungu, and Laura Miller, and uh, myself, Erfan Vafai, uh, that are part of this team. Uh, and so just before we get started, uh, for those of you wondering, well, he just spoke about some kind of a recording. Where would I access said recording? Well, these live webinars, they go uh, this year in 2021, they're going through the Texas uh, Texas Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab, the Facebook group. And so once we're no longer live, uh, the recording stays up there. They can also view it on the YouTubes and or share it from the YouTubes. Uh, and if you go to uh, Texas Plant Clinic on YouTube, subscribe to that channel. I, I, I recommend doing so if, if you want to see these recordings. And pay attention to this playlist, the Chat with Green Aggies playlist. So we do record these webinars and post it up there uh, for your viewing pleasure. So you can go back and catch any of these topics that you may have missed um, as we go along. So with that, uh, Suzanne, I'm going to invite you. And I just realized I wasn't sharing my screen there that whole time. So y'all didn't see at all what I was talking about. Uh, let me just real quickly show here again. Here we go. Uh, just so you can see, uh, again, go to YouTube, Texas Plant Clinic, all right? And you can subscribe right there. And there's this Chat with Green Aggies playlist. So in that playlist, uh, you can access all those videos by date and by topic so that you can see um, what you missed out on. All right, so with that, Suzanne, uh, and now I'm gonna ask you to share your screen and not make the same mistake I just made by not sharing my screen. Hey, Erevon, would sure. you post the link in the chat? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I will do that here just okay. as Suzanne is taking over. So right, thank you. Go. D go. Okay. <laughs> go. Yes. Go. Waiting Run. for that official, you know, go, <laughs> yeah, Suzanne. Go ahead. Take it. Don't want to jump the gun too oh, much. Whoa, oh, whoa. What are you? Easy there. Oh, <laughs> see? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Got to follow the rules. Got to follow the rules. <laughs> We're very strict here at Chat with Green Aggies. Is that is up? Is it up now? It is up. Yeah, you're live oh, and up. Yeah, good to go. You're live. Right, man. And I worked so hard to take a million slides out to try to keep it not too long because I wanted to make sure Carlos had enough time. <laughs> Scramble on, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, well, first, thank you guys for having me. Um, you know, I've been a, a, a looky loo watching uh, this for. Uh, a lot of COVID watching you guys have your discussion and thoroughly enjoyed it because it's nice to see my friends, even though you can't see them uh, in person, at least we can, you know, Zoom friend, which has uh, been kind of nice. And it's been a good way to keep connected. And even though, you know, I live now in Pennsylvania, I did grow up in zone nine. So um, I'm well acquainted with zone nine issues. Um, and a lot of the more tropical issues. So it's nice to keep up with what's going on uh, down south uh, since currently I can't travel there. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Suzanne Wainwright Evans. I own Bug Lady Consulting and I'm an independent insect consultant. I've had my business now, actually just clicked over to 21 years, but it's easier to say 20. And I work with uh, growers, botanical gardens, pretty much anybody that grows plants helps solve their insect issues, but I focus on using biological control agents and working with the integration of um, biocontrols and chemical pesticides because there's 
There's no programs I would say that are absolutely 100% biocontrol today. Um, it's, it's a merger of all the different tools we have to make them work. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about getting started with biocontrol. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like, um, you know, I've been doing this a, a long time. I've actually been in the industry um, 30 years, but there are still new people getting started with biocontrol. So I do think it's sometimes good to go over some of the basics. And one of the things I think is super helpful with biocontrol is to have what I call biocontrol buddy. Somebody that you can have in your back pocket um, that if you need help, you can quickly call or contact for information. I would love to be everybody's biocontrol buddy, but I can't do it. I just, I'm, you know, even with not being able to travel for 11 months now and really not working as much, I, I stretched pretty thin getting back to everybody that has all these quick questions. But there are lots of great people throughout the industry um, that uh, you can contact for help and including on the lower right down there is uh, Julie Gresh who's on the call with us today and um, she's excellent at nematode stuff she's done a lot of work with them but you know finding somebody you feel comfortable with uh, someone uh, that again good line of communication and that is knowledgeable and qualified to help you I think qualifications are really one of the key things because Biocontrol has exploded um, over the last several years. Um, and so everybody is jumping on the bandwagon and everybody is wanting to sell them and be involved. But you have to make sure people have the experience and the knowledge to actually provide you good, solid information. So first thing, when someone contacts me and says, hey, you know, we want to use biocontrol agents, we kind of have to go through this checklist of if it's right for you. Um, and a couple things they look at, it, it, it takes a huge commitment. And if it's an owner telling growers you're going to use biocontrol, but the growers aren't on board, it's not going to work. If the growers want to make it work, they will find a way to make it work. So it really takes a commitment from the growers, commitment to identify the insects. You have to have a real interest in doing this. And that's really built on having a solid scouting program, which is essential. Um, which by the way, at the Cultivate Show this July, I'll be teaching a full day scouting workshop if uh, people are interested in getting some more in-depth scout training. Um, the other big thing you have to look at is if there's actually a biocontrol agent for your problem. There are not beneficial insects and mites and nematodes that for every uh, pest issue we're dealing with out there. So sometimes if you have a pest like down in uh, Florida, and I know Texas has had this issue with a hibiscus bud weevil, there's not really a great biocontrol agent for it. So really um, it, it's, it's something that you can't just buy a bug in a bottle and release it to solve the problem. So you have to, to look at those things. You also have to look at economics and you have to look at pesticide compatibility you need to make sure if you're having to spray this, will your beneficials fit into that program? So identification is number one. Is there, I cannot preach this enough. And I'm thrilled to see now um, more and more people, you know, especially like on social media and someone says, oh, I've got a problem. Should I spray this? Everybody's like, well, we need to know specifically what that pest is. And just saying an aphid today is not good enough. We have to really know what it is. And same thing with thrips. Thrips are something I've really spent a lot of time on the last few years. Um, because here we have two very common um, thrips you find in a greenhouse. On the left is the poinsettia thrips, which is called the echino thrips, americanus. And then um, we have the western flower thrips on the right, which is another very common um, thrips pest. It's probably the most common floriculture uh, thrips we see. Now, why this is important is because if you just say you have thrips and you want to do biocontrol, we have to look to see which thrips you have because the poinsettia thrips on the left, we really don't have a good commercial biocontrol agent program for it. Cucumeris can't control it. Swirsky does not control it. Lamonicus does not control it. Aureus can snack a little on it, but it doesn't control it. So for poinsettia thrips, we do need to come in and spray either with a conventional pesticide or a micro microbial like Bavaria bassiana or Isaria. Western flower thrips, there's a million different things that eat Western flower thrips. And so that's why um, we can have a good solid program for them doing biocontrol agents. Also looking at their behavior, uh, poinsettia thrips do not pupate in the soil. They pupate on the plant, 
Western flower thrips, for the most part, pupate in the soil. That's important because nematodes are always recommended in thrips programs, but if you've got poinsettia thrips or one of the other thrips that doesn't pupate in the soil, the nematodes aren't going to do you any good. So that's why this level of identification is so important today so that we can get in there and give you the best program possible. You yourself do not have to know how, um, don't have to learn how to identify these things as long as you have the ability to collect them. And these little, you know, two dram vials you can get off of Amazon for very inexpensive. You can put them in alcohol in here and then get them to your extension agent or the specialist you're working with. Um, and then the specialist can identify them for you. And then uh, the management program can be put together. So scouting is another thing that's critical. Um, I, I'm blown away sometimes when I go to facilities and I meet with their scout and they don't even have a 10X hand lens to do their job. Scouting is critical and you need to have people committed to do it. It takes a skill set to do this. You can't just take any person and be like, hey, go find bugs. It's a learned skill over time. And if you find somebody that's good at it, you better cherish them and take care of them so they don't leave you um, because it takes a special kind of person that can find the insects and have the patience to look for it. And you also always want to make sure you provide them the right tool, like a hand lens, uh, sticky cards. And now there's several um, scouting software apps out there uh, that have been developed to help um, to, to get all the information done electronically so you can generate heat maps and other things which can help with some of the larger facilities uh, to help forecast where pests may be or see trends where pests have been. So you wanna make sure uh, you really provide them the tools they need. When you're scouting, something that's very important uh, with biocontrol is to look to see if beneficials have already shown up. This is something we see happening that once you start weaning off what I call the broad spectrum pesticides, pesticides that kill everything, and you are going into a more targeted pesticide program with softer products for beneficials, you do see a lot of native beneficials moving in. And the photo on the left is actually, it's an aphidolites larva, that's that orange maggot, and it's feeding on aphids. And this moved in on its own into a lettuce crop because um, they had aphids, they were concerned, but once we got in there and started looking, natural beneficials had come in on their own. So we were gonna hold off spraying right then. On the right, uh, those are milkweed slash oleander aphids. And uh, these were on a crop of oleanders. But if you look just to the right of them, you can see those little grains of rice right there. And those are surfed fly eggs. And surfed fly larvae are predatory on aphids. And their aphid number was relatively low, but you know we all know aphids reproduce very quickly, but those eggs are gonna hatch and they're gonna eat up all those aphids. So in this situation, we're like, we're not gonna spray yet. Let's monitor it and then see what happens in a couple of days. And good chances are you don't even have to come in and spray in that situation. So you wanna make sure that your scout is looking for these kinds of things as you're transitioning into a bio program. And how do we see these things? I cannot say it enough, Dynalite, just get one. Um, uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, Bug Lady Consulting, we did a whole uh, webinar a couple of weeks ago on the different Dynalite models, how to use them. No, I do not have any financial association with them, but it is an amazing tool. And if you guys can get better pictures, we can help you better to tell you what's going on on your plants. So is there a beneficial for my pest issue? Um, and we've come a long way um, and we, we can control more pests now with biocontrol than we did 20, 25 years ago. This is a very loose list. There's always exceptions, um, but uh, the commercial biocontrol options, you know, fungus gnats, yes, there's great options. What thrips, I'm gonna put in there the asterisk because it can depend on species, but the most common, more common ones that pupate on the foliage of the plant, um, we do have biocontrol agents for. We have biocontrol agents for lots of aphids, not all aphids, um, white flies, two spot spider mites, broad mites. The broad mite programs have gone leaps and bounds from where we were 10 years ago. Um, I feel very confident we can absolutely control broad mite with biocontrol. Uh, caterpillars, we do have egg parasites, even though they're not really used a lot in uh, the greenhouse market. And then we also have um, a, a two different uh, parasitoids for leaf miner. 
where we don't have such great options um, is mealybugs. Yes, there is a parasitoid for citrus mealybug out there. Um, but uh, there's been some challenges, I will say, with using that. Um, there is a predatory lady beetle, but generally those aren't used in commercial um, greenhouse operations, especially the ladybirds, because they get expensive. We use that more in a conservatory type of setting. Um, we don't really have any biocontrol options for root mealybugs or root aphids. Yes, a root beetle can eat a root aphid, but it doesn't control a population. We don't have great options for borers, psyllids, plant hoppers, flea beetles. There was a great webinar on flea beetles with Brian Kunkel, I think last week. Um, if you need to know about flea beetles, it's definitely worth watching. Um, and you know, th they're looking at using nematodes and microbials, but you still have the issue of even if you can control the larva in the pot with the nematode, you still have all the adults flying in and doing the damage. So you're still gonna have to make pesticidal applications. We don't have really commercial options for scale or hemp russet mite. Again, there's biocontrol agents out there that may possibly snack on it, but in a commercial setting, we have not seen them control a problem where we don't have to come in and spray. Population, population densities are important to look at um, and looking at different levels uh, because remember, we really want to focus on biocontrol as being a preventative. If you have an aphid situation like that on the left, um, you don't have time for the biocontrol agents to catch up. Yes, could you dump a thousand lacewing larvae on there and clean it up? Well, yes, but your plant's going to look gross. It's going to cost you a ton of money and it's just not an economical way to go. So in those kinds of situations, you definitely would want to do a knockdown spray. That's going to be soft on the beneficials that you're going to introduce. So looking at your population densities is very important. And this is why we really push to start the biocontrol and propagation, because then you can keep your populations low from ever building. A lot of um, facilities will wait till they see if they have a problem and then try to put out the fire. Um, we're really pushing to be preventative with biocontrol. As far as economics go, um, it's, very, it's been very interesting straddling uh, multiple industries um, where you have some situations where people say money doesn't matter, whatever it takes to fix it. Other industries are like, yeah, we can't spend three cents. So you really do have to get in and look to see if it's going to be economical for what you're doing. Um, some programs like spider mite management um, it's very economical to do with biocontrol, absolutely. Um, mealybug biocontrol, crazy expensive and doesn't even work that great. So you, you kind of have to look. So you have to look at your crop value. Are you dealing with a bedding plant or are you dealing with orchids or even uh, medical cannabis? They have very, very, very different values per square foot. One of the things with economics, which is very hard to put a number on, is uh, dealing with resistance issues because with um, resistance issues, again, if you can delay spraying, so instead of spraying five times a season, let's say you sprayed twice and you used biocontrol first, then moved into spraying, those three sprays you didn't do, what that does is it reduces the chances of that pesticide um, the pesticide developing, the insects developing resistance to that pesticide. So there's an economic value to having our pesticides last longer because, you know, we never want to hear that, oh, well, this pesticide doesn't work anymore um, because it's been sprayed too much. We had that issue with spinosad. We've had that issue with imidacloprid because of products being over, overused. By using beneficials as much as you can to put off some of your sprays, unless you absolutely have to, that is going to extend the life of that pesticide and that will give it to us in the marketplace for longer. And again, there's economic value to that, but it's hard to put a number on. And remember too, when you're comparing biocontrol agents to spring, you can't just look at, well, an order of bugs is $200 and the same tank of pesticide is like the $100 uh, because reentry time is a big thing. You know, a lot of pesticides today can have, you know, we all want that magic four hour REI, but some have 12 and 24. Um, with the biocontrol agents, there is no REI. So your workers can continue to work while you're applying beneficials or even after you're done applying them. Um, 
Spray equipment could be costly to maintain, including the respirators and just stuff with the equipment, where most of the biocontrol agents were applying by hand, but you do have the cost of labor of doing that. And you do have to, with the pesticides, maintain a spray license, but I think everybody should have one um, just so they're educated on pesticides. So it's really hard to do a, a direct comparison, um, but you kind of have to do your own analysis in-house. But again, there are certain programs, uh, again, definitely like spider mites and now even broad mite, we know are very economical programs to be doing. And uh, Western flower thrips is another one um, because uh, when you're on a pure spray program for those, um, it's very challenging because you're only killing with the sprays, uh, the early in stars and the adults, and you're missing the eggs and the pupa in the soil. And those are two things that the biocontrol agents can get. And one other hidden value, um, which I still do not see our industry doing, is marketing that they're doing this. I think the consumers are very interested in this. Um, I'm very involved with a lot of the houseplant groups because of the the house plant trend going on right now and those homeowners are all interested in buying biocontrol agents for their plants if they knew they could buy plants that were grown with biocontrol that they could buy a calathea that already had persimilis on it so when they bring it home they don't have to worry there's an added value to things like that so i still think um, our industry needs to be looking at um the, bio, the options of oops uh the options of marketing this out there um, now, as far as the sector goes, where do we get these bugs? Um, in the US market, because Canada is a little different, these are the main, there are some little smaller guys around, but these are the, the Coke and Pepsis of the biocontrol world um, that all have um, product lines, they have technical support, they have good literature. BASF um, does nematodes and they do have now uh, microbial products of Bavaria bassiana velifer. Um, but th these guys are the people that are actually producing the biocontrol agents out there. Now, there's always this discussion of insectary or distributors, and please don't, you know, send me all kinds of hate things for this. But this is, and there's always exceptions, but I have always been much more of an advocate of buying your bugs direct from the insectary because the bugs are drop shipped direct to you. With distributors, you may or may not get them direct. And that's a good question to ask. There are some distributors that you place your order with them, the insectary will drop it direct, but not necessarily. In fact, I found um, an insectary's product being sold on a website the other day and I emailed them and I said, hey, are these guys a distributor of yours? And they're like, no, we don't even know who they are. And it turns out that website was buying them from another distributor. So physically the bugs were like being passed through a couple hands before they would even get to um, the grower, which you do not want old biocontrol. It's, it's like sushi. You don't want day old sushi. You don't want day old biocontrol. So make sure you get it uh, direct shipped as much as possible. Also, when you work with an insectary, you're working with people that this is all they do, ins and outs. I mean, they, they live, breathe biocontrol agent bugs. Distributors, they're often selling lots of different products, fertilizers, pesticides, biocontrol agents, and lots of different things. So they're not as focused. So they may not be as up to date on the information or have as much drive to learn about that um, because uh, of those things. Um, one of the disadvantages into the insectary is they're not good about website ordering. Um, you just can't like go go click on the BioBest website and order bugs. Um, and, uh, you know, because they tend to have more direct relationships with the growers. Distributors, there's websites popping up every day you can buy bugs from. Um, and the thing with those distributors, though, you don't know who's a brand of bugs you're giving, getting. And you guys all know if you get in discussions with me at a trade show, you know, well, there's quality difference between the biocontrol agents, and I always want to know where they're directly coming from. Insectaries, they generally have good pricing because they are selling direct. Now, with the distributors, if they're more of a traditional distributor, uh, they're going to have good pricing. But man, when I look at some of the prices people are paying when they just go to a website to order, they're two or three times sometimes the price um, as if you were to order it from the insectary. So you do have to kind of watch that. Now, as far as pesticide compatibility goes, this is still probably the number one killer of biocontrol programs. We still have challenges today um, with pesticide compatibility. Um, we just had, um, 
uh, one of the um, growers I'm dealing with, they were actually doing some leaf tissue analysis. And um, a good example is if you look up um, uh, a py pyganic, not picking up pyganic, but a natural pyrethrin like that. Um, after they sprayed it on their crop, they were doing leaf tissue analysis each week and three weeks later was finally before it was really undetectable in the crop. So it was persisting for three weeks in the plant. And you think of these natural products that they should be pretty compatible with beneficials, you spray them, you think should be able to re-release, but they're persisting sometimes longer than we think. And so um, pesticides can be a very challenging uh, thing to work out in a bio program. And often people forget about fungicides because fungicides can uh, really whack a mole on your beneficials uh, too. So you have to watch them. So when I go to get started, I always want to see two months of spray records from that crop. Um, know about the beneficials that have been or going to be released so that we can coordinate, okay, if we spray to this on this date, we can't release till here. Or if we have to spray on this date, let's set our release for here. So we have to do a lot of counting of days and looking up about residuals to get it to work. Um, now, with, to get this compatibility information to know how long um, after you spray something before you can release something is BioBest Colbert, um, they have, um, and same thing with AgroBio, they have mobile apps and websites where you can get that information, uh, which I'll show you here in a second. BASF has a, a fact sheet for their nematodes and BioWorks also, um, who is now selling biocontrol agents, also has a piece of literature that they have pesticide compatibility on it for not only their biocontrol bio agents, but also their microbials like uh, the Bavaria bassiana, botanogard, and trichoderma and root shield. So this is a, an example, um, and I actually do have a whole presentation I, I do on pesticide compatibility, but let's look at fluoramide, because fluoramide has always been marketed as very compatible with biocontrol agents. What's interesting about this is when you go in and actually start looking at the um, compatibility with the beneficials, um, so you look at Californicus and Cucumera sorskin persimilis. These are all three very commonly used predatory mites. So a green number one means less than 25% mortality, where a three is about 75% mortality and two is around 50% mortality. It's interesting that Californicus and Cucumeris are considered pretty safe with them. So they get a green number one. But look at Swirsky. If you spray this, it's gonna kill about 75% of your population or if you do spray it, you have to wait one week before you can reintroduce this predatory mite. And you have to wait a week with Persimilis also. So, I mean, is it compatible? Well, in a way it is, but it's not like super compatible. Let's say you had been releasing Persimilis, but you the predatory, the pest mites number were eking out of control a bit and you kind of wanted to do a knockdown spray. If it was Persimilis, you may want to look at Sultan because Sultan has no impact on Persimilis. But if you're releasing Californicus, then you could use Fluoramite because it's considered much more uh, compatible there. So also beneficials have needs. And again, I don't want to spend too much time because I don't want to be a time hog. Um, but beneficials do have requirements. And this is something that your insect provider should go through all this stuff with you. One of the big things with Aureus, the minute pirate bug, that's the one up here top sitting on the yellow petal. Um, they're used a lot for Western flower thrips control and Western flower thrips is a big problem in spring. So people wanna get them out early. The problem is, is they need a minimum of 12 hours of light. So you have to look where you are in the United States and when your greenhouse hits that 12 hours or you have to supplement with artificial lighting. So um, it's important to look at these details when using beneficials um, to make sure that you get the right beneficial for the right job. And again, this is where it's helpful to have that bug buddy. So you don't have to go necessarily do all that research yourself because as I climb around the internet more and more, um, and I will say this, the, the internet has somewhat been hijacked by the cannabis industry because there's so many blogs and websites up and a lot of it is bad information, bad photos, bad recommendations. And so that bad information is just getting perpetuated. So it's good to stick with university websites or people that have years of experience doing this so to make sure you get the right information on what you need. 
Proper application is really critical too. Um, and there are multiple ways to apply uh, beneficial insects, mites, and nematodes. Um, nematodes, I'm pretty excited. It's, it's not here yet, but there's actually a slow release nematode coming, which is gonna be really exciting um, for the media. Um, so that will be a new application method for nematodes, but you have to find what works in your growing system. Um, and when you get these beneficials, you know, understand what life stage they're coming in, what can you expect, what kind of packaging, what kind of carrier is, uh, are you going to use? Um, because certain um, growing situations, you can't use all carriers. You know, if you're growing lettuce, you can't broadcast predatory mites over the top because you can't have the carrier falling in to uh, the center of the lettuce crops. So you have to understand how they're packaged, the carriers to make sure you order the right thing for you. Because if you really start looking with the insectaries, like cucamaris, you can probably order it 15 different ways, different carriers, different packaging. Do you want the bottle? Do you want them in a sachet? So you really need to look at all these different options and see what's right for your system. Um, this is a good example for Phytocelis persimilis. Uh, persimilis is one of my favorite predatory mites. Uh, these are all different ways they can be applied. Um, with the, the bottle with the nibble top is one of my favorites um, for smaller, lower plants. Um, you can sprinkle it out, which you can have vials like here in the middle leftish. Um, they're being applied with drones now out in California. Um, that market has really exploded for outdoor applications of bios using the drones, not only predatory mites, uh, lace wings and parasitoids. You can hand apply them in the bottle. Um, a lot of growers now are using blowers to apply them out. This is what we mostly see in greenhouse and nursery. And then here up on the top right, you can just buy a cup of straight persimilis. Um, that comes from BioB. They call it the persimilis bomb. And then you can mix it up into the carrier you want. So you can have the dilution weight you want. Or I believe it or not, some people just set that out in a crop. Not recommended, but that's what some people do if they're really trying to make sure um, they want to eliminate a problem. So there's multiple ways to apply, you know, a beneficial out there. Lace wings are another that um, you have different sizes of packaging um, that can be used, uh, that can be applied out. So if someone says to you, hey, you need to use lace wing. Okay, well, what do I need to do? Do I want larva? Do I want eggs? Do I want adults? Do I want them on release cards? So you really have to look at all these different things to figure out which is going to be best for your system, because there is not one standard answer for everybody. You know, people are like, why can't we have, you know, just can't you just give me a written program for a, a pest in a crop? We really have to look at the details of how you grow, what you grow, length the crop to really uh, craft a program specifically for you. So here, I just wanted to show you, I was talking about the outdoor application. This is um, a joint project with Parabug, who is the drone company and beneficial insectary. They've been doing a lot of these applications, not only in vegetables, um, but in hemp and cannabis in California. We actually, uh, a year and a half ago, we did an outdoor release on the mums at Metrolina, which was really cool too. So I just wanted to give you an example um, with the Western flower thrips, um, why biocontrol has been such a good option for this because we have biocontrol agents that will eat the eggs, the two larval stages, the pre-pupa, pupa and adult. We've got beneficials that will eat them all. Biopesticides can target some life stages, same thing with conventional chemistries. And I think this is why thrips in the past were so challenging to manage because we were missing the egg and the pupa in the soil stage. Um, and now we know we can target those with biocontrol agents. And you can use a combination of all these products to have a good solid program. And this is like, if you, this is probably about the only cookie cutter program I will put out there where we're using predatory mites, for the eggs and the first in stars. And that could be either like Swirsky or Cucamaris, the two main ones that are used. Um, then we use nematodes in the soil uh, for the pupa. You can also use things like rope beetles. You can also use things like a lelaps, a predatory mite. And then we use microbials on um, the foliage to get the immatures and adults. So, you know, we're spraying on the foliage, we're putting mites in the foliage and we're putting beneficials in the soil. And this kind of completes the whole um, Western flower thrips program. So why do bio programs fail? Um, because you're going to fail 
it happens, but you just have to figure out why. And this is one of the things I hate to say it, but I really love doing is trying to figure out why a program failed. Um, oftentimes it comes back to pesticide residue. We have a lot of problems with spray tranks, not getting triple rinsed. Um, I highly recommend that if you're going to have some of the harder conventional pesticides around things like bifenthrin, um, it, it has its own spray tank. And then you have a separate spray tank for your microbial products that you're going to be using in your uh, bio programs. So there's no contamination there. Um, improper identification. Uh, numerous times we've had people on that thrips program i just saw it doesn't work it doesn't work and then you go and you look and it's a kind of thrips and that's part of the problem because the bios aren't going to work on that um wrong bio control agent that exactly ties right in there like people um releasing persimilis for russet mite it's not going to work uh, wrong application um, I've seen a lot of people dumping like persimilis and cucumeris on the soil, hoping they'll climb up into these plants. So many of those mites are not going to make it into the plant. Um, you want to make sure it's applied uh, in the appropriate location on the plant for where your target pest is. Poor communication with your supplier. Um, that's something that's why you want that good relationship. Um, not handling beneficials correctly. Um, a classic example of that is you get sachets. Put them in the refrigerator. You never want to store your sachets in your refrigerator. If anything, you want to open the box and store them in your greenhouse until you get them out. But if you get something um, like uh, persimilis, and even though you really want to get those out as soon as possible, if you do have to store them, you could put the bottles on the side in a cool area, not necessarily cold like a refrigerator. Um, BioWorks does have a piece of literature you can ask them for, and it has. Um, the majority of the commercial biocontrol agents and how if you had to store them for a day how you could emergency store them even though we try really hard not to do that um, then there's always the poor quality product it does happen sometimes just if you notice there's a problem contact your supplier as soon as possible um, that's another whole workshop i do is on quality controlling beneficials and how to check to see if they're viable um, and it sounds like there's going to be a series of videos coming. Uh, I believe it's uh, Rose Bouton House working on those up in Canada. So hopefully those will be available uh, soon that it can help teach growers how to do their own QC. So with that, um, tried to keep it to was aiming for a half an hour, but I'm not sure exactly how I did on that. But if anybody has any questions, did Carlos show up? Perfect. No, unfortunately, uh, I hope he's okay because it's going straight to yeah. the answer machine. So, um, and usually he's 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 really good about these things. So, uh, fingers crossed, he's okay, and we'll we'll find out a, a time, date, or somehow to still get that recorded and, and available to y'all. Uh, thank you so much, Suzanne. If there are any questions, so there were some questions uh, asking things directly from your presentation. So I was able to uh, answer them right there in the chat. I do have a mm -hmm. quick question um which is kind of what crop or what system do you usually see people first starting to try a biological control program in and i'm coming at that with from the angle of you know i'm thinking like poinsettias are a relative monocrop and usually have one main pest which are the white flies in some areas mm -hmm. you also have mealybugs but so usually it lends itself quite nicely to biological control. Are there other such systems that, that you see are kind of early, uh, you know, first, first gateway uh, systems for starting a biological control program? Um, I think that, um, well, herbs is what, not because herbs are easy, but because a lack of registered pesticides for herbs. And people don't really want to be spraying edible herbs. Um, and so that's one market. Um, the other one, probably the majority, I would say, in floriculture is spring bedding plants um, because of thrips. Um, and now with broad mites. And the other one's uh, New Guinea and patients with broad mites. That's a, a pretty easy program, actually, now that we know how to do it. Um, and so you'll see people doing biocontrol on New Guineas, but maybe not everything else. Um, I think poinsettia is interestingly enough, people are tend to be later adopters on that um, hmm. because of the profit margin, or I will say the lack of profit margin in poinsettias. And um, the purse strings are very tight on that. Um, 
I will say since the pressure to reduce neonic use has happened in poinsettias, we've had more adopters of it because back, I mean, the, the, the glory days of when a metacloprid first hit the market and we had no resistance issues, not a care in the world and you drenched it, boom, we were done. Um, you know, those days are, are gone. Um, there's still some people, um, and there are some still some good products, but even the good products that are working now, eventually we're gonna run into resistance issues and that's gonna push them more into um, the poinsettias. And also too, I often have, what happens is with poinsettias is people start them on spray programs because they're well spaced and they can get good spray coverage with even like a soap or an oil and everything's great. Once that canopy closes and color comes, and if you really didn't get those them knocked out and you were just suppressing them, then the white flies explode. And that's when people are like, oh my gosh, we, we're in color. We've got white flies. What can we spray? And it's like, ah, you know, it's, it's, it's a real problem. And so that's why if you're going to do point studies, you need to start from propagation and get all those parasitoids established out there early. Um, predatory mite Swirsky has been a great part of that program. Eating the white fly eggs, it, it stops the eggs even before they hatch. So, um, you know, that's, it, it, it used to be early on, uh, we did bio control as people did spray it first. And then we moved into bios as the canopy closed. Now we've completely reversed that train of thought for probably about 10 years now, because we found if you start with the bios, it keeps the crop clean. And then you don't have the problems when you finish the crop. Um, and you can get those beneficials established out there. But, um, but you know, I, I will say as far as pest goes, the, the gateway always into biocontrol, the gateway drug is using nematodes for fungus snap management because you don't have to alter really anything else you're doing um, to do that in your program. Or even if you're on a conventional spray program for thrips, at least put nematodes into the soil. And so those are the easy ways to get in. But biocontrol for poinsettias is actually a the program's not complicated, but monitoring and implementing it can be uh, ch a little more challenging. Yeah, Su Suzanne, I'd, I'd agree with you with the nematodes, especially in um, propagation houses where there's a lot of moisture uh, and depending on the type of floors, uh, if they weren't concrete or if they had you know, gravel or, or they would get muddy, um, using the nematodes that the grower would see the results rather quickly and would get them excited about it. So I, I, I definitely would say propagation was, was also one of the other areas. Yeah, mini roses are another really easy, good crop um, to do them in because they're usually pretty tight on benches. Um, and we've got biocontrol, we've got biocontrol agents for all their pests. So we got a uh, we got a question when mentioning your Western Flower Thrips program. What microbials can you suggest for cannabis? Uh, well, first of all, I will say it depends on what state you're in, but um, mostly in cannabis, we're using Bavaria bassiana wettable powder formulations. Uh, really push on that because that will be compatible with your predatory mites and Isaria, um, which can be found in uh, products like um, No Fly, uh, Ancora and PFR 97. Um, but again, you got to look at your states because all the states have different rules. Like in Pennsylvania and medical cannabis, we cannot use those. But you go to Maine, you can use some of them, California, Colorado. So it just depends on which state. I think uh, they just mentioned in Alaska. So I'm not sure. Alaska is not as restrictive as other states. You should be able to <clears throat> use the Bavarian Isaria. But let me tell you, it is really challenged my mental ability to keep up with all the regulations and all yeah. the legal cannabis <laughs> I was gonna say, like, I don't think I've ever had to work with Alaska, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenge, um, I tell you. But, you know, as much as that goes in, I think a lot of old stuff is falling out <laughs> the other side of things I needed to remember. Um, uh, but and there's some very good programs uh, with what's great about uh, the by Bavarian Isaria is if you have a cold fogger and this is what the ornamental guys have done a great job with is they release the predatory mites they do the nematodes and then they cold fog the microbials and then let that do the work on those other life stages you can't use a traditional fogger because they'll heat up but a cold fogger really saves on the labor of that program and it works very well and with the combination of those programs you don't have to worry about resistance issues because as of yet we have seen no resistance to any of the bavaria zyzerias or even metarhizium 
Um, I had this discussion with some of the insect pathologists up at uh, Cornell and I mean, you can never say never, but the likelihood of building resistance is pretty slim with the microbials where we know with uh, the synthetic pesticides, if we work at it, we can get insects resistant to the chemistry in just a few generations by giving them sublethal doses. Uh, there's another question that came in. Uh, are there a bio is there like a biological control for some kind of recurring mites, unknown type in bald cypress? I guess they would have known the type if there was a mite ID talk, uh, but unfortunately they, they, we don't know the type that they're dealing with. But I don't with, know if you, are you familiar with common mites on bald cypress? I thought they got a type of spider mites. Remember spider mites, a whole family and so there could be multiple ones in there. So if you are independently wealthy, you could buy, you know, the top five or six predatory mites, throw them out there and see what happens. A lot of us aren't independently wealthy. So I would say collect some of the mites in alcohol and get them to your extension or, you know, whomever, because again, don't know what state you're in, get them to somebody, get them ID'd. Then we can kind of reverse and go backwards to see if there's been any research done on that. And then if not, then we can try because we have that where we um, occasionally would get outbreaks down in uh, Florida on tropical foliage. We'd release persimilis heavily. And all of a sudden we'd see this red mite showing up and I sent it off and it uh, turned out to be Tetranicus tumidus, which is a cousin to a two-spot spider mite, but Persimilis wouldn't eat it. And so we ended up doing some testing down there. And then we found this predatory mite from the Pacific Northwest called Phalasis actually would feed it. Did that mite like being in Florida, the predatory mite? No, but it cleaned it up and that's all we needed. So that's kind of sometimes how we figure these things out is we just have to, to test. So it seems like the most important thing initially is to find out what type of mite that is. Uh, so yeah. unknown type, unfortunately, doesn't work when we're talking biological control. That's well, kind I of mean, even with, even with miticides, though, because you look at, you know, uh, Sultan, it only does, it won't do like broad mites. So, I mean, even with the miticides today, we really kind of have, have to have a general idea of what it is. Are there any other questions from our uh, audience or attendees? I have today? a question, uh, Suzanne. Um, in one of your pictures, you have a uh, uh, a container of plant. Uh, it says, you know, what's this? I can't remember what's the 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 wording on that. It says, you know, what's this plant doing here or something? Is that wheat? Oh. Wheat grass? Is that for the uh, for that's um, a banker plant? Huh? That's a banker plant. That's a banker bird plant. Yeah. yeah, that's bird cherry odaphids. But watch, Irfan, because you're now going to see fava beans with pea plants for Irvine banker plant programs. Oh, They're neat. Being, yeah. Oh, um, very good. John Sanderson's working with a grower in New York, and I've got one in North Carolina we're testing with, and I just got more pictures this morning, and we're starting to see the parasitism happen. But the idea is um, we put plants with pest insects in a greenhouse, but those pests don't move onto your crop, but it provides food for your beneficial. So I equate it to like putting a McDonald's in your neighborhood. It's a place you, you know, you can eat at home, but if you need something else to eat, you can run out and get it at the McDonald's and then come back home. Yeah. So it becomes a constant source of your parasitic wasp in this case, which, which, um, you know, could greatly improve the economics of biological control program. Which, I, uh, I really yeah. haven't seen it a whole lot in other places, but I, I've seen it in Oregon and one of your buddies, the, the one on the uh, upper left corner of your slide, it says, you know, he's the best uh, dad in the whole. Uh, oh, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> Yes, Kelly. Yes, yes. Kelly Vance. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the only time that you know uh, I was visiting the the greenhouse that he was working in. You know, he he showed us uh, that that banker plant, and it was it was it was pretty cool. But I just, I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, why have we not seen it, uh, or have you seen it used in many other places? It's, the, it's a geography thing. Um, it's a geography, I, okay. I'm going to say this very lovingly, um, but Texas <laughs> hasn't been a real big adopter of biocontrol. What? Um, yeah, I don't, even, I don't even see them in my rear view mirror um, at this point. Um, go to like North Carolina. Um, Costa heavily does it. Metrolina heavily does it. Um, Dickman's Farms in New York does it. Um, 
people are doing it. Is it for everybody? No. Um, you have to have people, um, you have to have some, you have to have basically a person committed to taking care of the plants, babysitting them, growing them and doing them. Um, the other thing with the bird cherry odifid system, um, it has to be done very early and it's an, a spring thing because bird cherry odifids don't like it hot and the reproduction really slows down. So if it gets too hot, like it does down south, you know, this is not something that you're gonna be doing in you know, June, July, August kind of thing. But often by then, a lot, not all aphids like the extreme heat either. And so some of those numbers decline, but often what we see happening then is we see a lot of the surfed flies moving in. Um, in Canada, they actually do have commercial surfed fly production, but they can't import it to the US. I've been begging some in the insectaries. I'm like, it would be great if we could have a surfed fly product. Um, for the U.S. market because it would pick up on some of the shortfalls some of the other biocontrol agents have. And those larvae are very aggressive predators. In fact, um, my grower doing the P. aphid banker plant system, she sent me a picture yesterday, which I had in my presentation yesterday. Um, I spoke to a bunch of U.S. students yesterday, University of Florida, um, that she's like, what's this on my banker plants? And it was surfed flies had come in and had gotten on their banker plants already and were eating the P aphids. And so, you know, in that situation, the surfids are a bit of a pest because you're trying to grow aphids, but you're also feeding your surfids, which will then go out into your crop and then lay more eggs. So um, we're still, you know, looking and growing when it comes to biocontrol, but uh, certain states are just not as, advanced on them. The Northeast corridor of the United States, it's like, it's a whole different world when I deal with those growers because they're so advanced on it. Um, the Pacific Northwest is pretty heavy into it. Um, Florida is limited into it. It's mainly for spider mite management. That's the big thing in Florida is because spider mites are on so many things. And so most of my growers I work with there, it's about spider mite management. Then we use traditional chemistries and microbials for everything else. Well, and uh, Dr. Lance Osborne worked a long time on banker plant systems with the bank's grass mite for spider mite management. I mean, he's been working on it for a long time. Yes, and it's it's great research, yeah. but it's not applicable to commercial growing operations. And it's not as adopted as you might think over, I mean. I don't know anybody that's used it. Yeah. Because here's with, the thing. Go, go, go. Well, it, with banker plants, they have to fly. You can't do mites because like the idea of using pepper plants to grow Swirsky, it's awesome. You want to grow a ton of Swirsky mites, get red hot missiles, slap Swirsky on there and they'll explode. Now you got a pepper plant covered in Swirsky. How do you get those Swirsky you into your poinsettias? You, you grow predatory mites on corn, on Banks grass mite. How do you get that out into your ornamental crop over 15 acres? You can't, you need beneficials that fly. And that's, that's the issue there. And then the papaya system he did is brilliant using wow. papaya plant with a papaya white fly with Encarcia Sophia, but you can't use that program outside of the state of Florida because you can't ship the plants around. The, the bird cherry oat aphids, any of you guys can call right now, Sierra Biological, BioWorks, Beneficial Insectary and have a chunk of, of aphids show up on your porch tomorrow morning. That's so a typical that's, reason why someone calls an insectary company, but, <laughs> or sorry, I should say a, a pest control company. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, but I mean, and this right, is the but, thing yeah, is, yeah. is it's, it's given us, the Lance's work has given us great information, but unfortunately it's not been adoptable into mainstream ag. That's been the challenge there. Got one last question. Um, what would you use for chili thrips? Uh, so I don't know how much you've had to work with chili thrips and whether you know of a, an effective program for biocontrol program for them. It depends on, again, economics of the crop. Um, we have, I've had a couple situations with high dollar plants. Um, one was a theme park, which had to have things looking really purdy. Um, and another one <laughs> was um, an interior scape situation um, where you can't spray. And if you put enough Swirsky out, they, they, we got ahead of them. Um, but if you are a conventional grower, the economics aren't necessarily going to be there because the rates were higher that we applied and we did multiple applications. 
I still think it may be worth going back and looking at um, some more um, because there are more, um, there's more competition in the Swirsky market these days um, on pricing. Um, but- So you think the pricing is improving? Yeah, with competition and more production. Um, yeah, I, it's still expensive. I mean, it's still three times the price of like, you know, Cucamaris. Um, so it's expensive. So I'm a little more reserved in using it when we don't have to. But again, depends on what the crop is. I mean, if, if you know, these are your estate roses at the front door of your house, you know, the governor's mansion, I think it would be worth doing some heavy applications and monitoring it to see if you could get them to work there. But again, if you're growing a $1.99 six inch mini roses going to Walmart, economics are probably not going to necessarily be there for that. And um, again, back to the whole, the whole nematode discussion, wish nematodes worked, but the, the chili thrips are physically too small for the nematodes to get in um, and work. I mean, chili thrips are just, I mean, in Florida, they're just part of the landscape now. And I know you guys have, uh, well, Airfon and I've been out looking at chili thrips together down there. So in the Houston uh, area and yeah, further south. Yeah. Um, let's see. All right. I think that's all the questions that we got. Um, thank you so much, Suzanne, again, for joining us and, and talking about dipping your toes in biological control. It's always such a pleasure having you and, what? uh, learning. just asked a weird thing What's off that? topic, went to your website and in seen install bug lady consulting. Yeah. That's what I was kind of reading. As I was saying, I think we're done with the questions. Uh, but, that might well, be a technical <laughs> glitch going on. Yeah. If you just type in bugladyconsulting.com. It takes you to my website. I just checked it. It's just there. I just updated it yesterday um, because I have some new published articles in the trade magazines. Um, since I've been home, I've been writing a bit more. So I'm not sure what that's about. I know it wasn't a bug question, but I always have panic because my website in the past was hacked three times. So oh I'm always gosh. freaked out about my it website. Sounds like a, it sounds uh, like a web okay. a web bug. Sorry? I just pulled it up. It looks good. It looks fine. Yeah. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. When I Googled yeah. it, it says bug lady consulting test one. In this Google, I've been I think it's fighting just... with Google on that. They will not <laughs> fix it. We don't know why it says that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Suzanne, I just put your link bar. in the thing. Is that the uh is that the ride link? Bugladyconsulting.com. Yeah, well, you sent the one that's about pest management, but that's fine. That works. That goes right there. Okay. All right. Yeah, that all works. So, all so right. this is just a dip our toe in just the, dipping. Uh, this is just a dip in. So when are we <laughs> going to have an immersion? <laughs> well, and that's the thing, you know, each one of those slides is almost a talk in itself. And that's why the, the Northeast uh, group of educational, like with Vermont and Connecticut and all that, they are having me do um, much more in depth uh, you know, specific stuff like, you know, they had me do like a whole thing just on aphids like two years ago. Um, and they just sent me a list of new topics they want me to consider. And they're all much more advanced levels, but we got to get people using it and getting their toe in it first, you know, getting them using the nematodes um, uh, and, and those basic things. But again, I think for Texas, spider mite management is is the gateway down there because that's what's worked in Florida, similar pests, similar crops, similar growing zones. And I think that's the way in there. And the, the biocontrol agents for uh, spider mites like Persimilis, um, I've definitely become much more affordable. When I actually used to sell, back in 1996, when I sold Persimilis, it was uh, $20 for 2000 mites. And now I've seen growers paying as low as nine and $10 for larger consumption of it. So, I mean, the price is almost cut in half from what it used to be. Um, so it's, it, it, the, some of these mites have definitely become much more affordable. All right. Well, thanks again, Suzanne, so much for, uh, yeah, a nice little insight into how to dip your toes into biocontrol. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot involved in starting a biological control program, as we've learned today. And it, it is a, you know, step-by-step -step process, uh, but I think it does kind of start with that good monitoring, be able to identify your pests, and then from there, identifying a system that is perhaps um, suitable for, for starting a biological control program. 
I've also placed there in the chat, uh, our brief survey. If you don't mind, please, please, please. Uh, very important, especially for our green industry professionals uh, that are attending to please uh, do that survey that that is kind of what's going to help keep this webinar going if we can demonstrate that it has some importance has some impact. Uh, so please do fill that out. That is very helpful. And uh, we're going to have yet again, obviously another chat with green Aggies next week, which is going to be on the topic that I am currently. <laughs> you don't know. Dr. Kavanaugh. A Dr. K root rot diseases. Yeah, oh, Phytophthora root rots. <laughs> ah, there we yes. go. Dr. Ong, do you want to give us a brief little uh, preview of, of what you're going to be talking about? Oh, you know what? I got to unmute you. Hang on. All about Phytophthora root rots. All yeah. about. All about. Phy all about oh, there hey, root quick rocks. quick question is is next week a ceu program it is all yeah. right um so so one one of the biggest headaches that we have with on, on the landscape plants uh, especially in the spring uh it's it's, it's root rots and a lot of times uh, the test would come back and say it's my top for root rot um whether it's from rain incidences, uh, highly moist, uh, highly moist conditions, or you know, poor irrigation, especially people tend to think we need to water a lot when it's actively growing. It doesn't contribute to 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 making healthy plants. So we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna, you know, I'm gonna hopefully be able to show you a bunch of pictures, um, some of those damage on the roots. Um, and, and actually some of the things that are happening on the top too, because we talk about Phytophthora root rods, uh, a bunch of it is root rods, but we do have a subsegment of aerial uh, rods as well, which are caused by Phytophthora, uh, which is, is pretty common on younger plants. So when you think about landscape plants, this is about time of the year where you see it, we see an uptick of it. So come back next week. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ong. And that concludes our chat with Green Aggies, unless any of my other colleagues have something to throw in there before we sign off. I was going to say that this is a great time to not plant your shrubs if you're replacing your shrub beds, not plant them right under the drip line from your roof, because that's where I see a lot of phytophthora root rot happening. So there we go. In, in case you're planning on doing it before this next webinar, you just maybe saved a lot of landscapers out there. <laughs> All right. Thank you all so much for coming and we'll hopefully see you again next week. Thanks. Thanks.